This Sabbath, we're going to be talking about shepherds, sheep, and lambs. And I want to begin with a story in the Bible that um, it's really one of the pinnacles of Scripture. If you turn in your Bibles to Genesis 22, and I expect everybody here knows this, it's one of the most famous stories, not only among Christians and Jews, but even in, in uh, other faiths, about Abraham, who brought his son. God spoke to him and early one morning, very clearly, the Lord said, Abraham, Abraham, take your son, your only son, who you love, and bring him to the mountains of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering unto me. Now this is the son, of course, who waited for all these years. Incredible test of faith. But he obeyed. And you go, I'm going to begin with verse 6 in Genesis 22. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. He laid it on Isaac, his son, just as a cross was placed upon Jesus. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And the two of them went together to the place of sacrifice. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. He said, Here I am, my son. Notice the phrase, I am, is in here. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, I believe under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in a very cryptic word in Hebrew, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And that can actually be rendered, God will provide himself, or it can be rendered, God the son will provide himself. So this statement, this answer that he gives to Isaac is a prophecy that reaches down through the ages. God will provide himself a lamb. Well, we're going to be talking today about shepherds and sheep and lambs. And I think to understand the Bible, you need to know something about this form of husbandry because it is literally from cover to cover in the Bible. The Bible is full of sheep and shepherds. And these illustrations are used in the New and the Old Testament. Just to give you a little background, uh, today, you know, in old times, a lot of people lived where there were sheep on the farm, and if it wasn't the, uh, the beef and the pork, it was the mutton. So folks knew something about sheep. But in our culture today, you know, a lot of people live, most people live in cities. And you can live your whole life uh, and never touch a lamb. Well, let me give you a few facts about sheep. First of all, if you have trouble sleeping and you're counting sheep, you'll have lots of options because there are over a thousand different kinds of sheep. That's between domestic and wild sheep. Sheep have rectangular pupils, unlike many animals. This gives them a very uh, good uh, vision all the way around. They can see up to 310 degrees around their body when they're looking straight ahead can't quite see what's going on behind them, but I think God designed them this way because in one way, sheep are sort of the bottom of the food chain. Uh, they're, they're, they don't have any real aggressive factors. They're very docile, which is why God chose them for the sacrificial system because they are a type of Christ. They're also a type of you, but they can see pretty well around them. There are approximately 30 million sheep in New Zealand, meaning there are six sheep for each human. New Zealand is a great place for sheep. I've been there a couple of times, and uh, they have no natural predators and grass everywhere, and they just flourish. Sheep provide a lot of products you may not know about for people. Not only, of course, wool, hide, mutton, milk, baseballs, tennis balls. Think about that next time you play. Thank a sheep. Lanolin, clothing, drum heads, yarn, art brushes, sports equipment, carpet, textiles, insulation, glue, ointment base, footwear, paint and plaster, binder, felt, if you play pool, on a pool table, upholstery, and asphalt binder for when you drive down the road. Do you ever think of sheep and thank them? <laughs> they found one of the best things for binding asphalt is used wool. Sheep don't have any front teeth. That's right. They, they're born without dentures in the front. They, no upper teeth, I should say. They've got the lower teeth. 
Uh, they've got a hard upper palate that they use to chew against. So I guess you could say they are all bleat and no bite. <laughs> the oldest age recorded for a sheep was 28 years that lived in Wales. Now, as you look through the Bible, I'm going to quickly go through the Old Testament because the Old Testament has a lot to say about sheep, and then we'll go to the New Testament. The first death, not only recorded in the Bible, in history, but perhaps in the cosmos, in all history, was a lamb. After Adam and Eve sinned and they tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves, God said that would not do, and it says he gave them tunics of skin. That's Genesis 3, 21. For Adam and his wife, God made tunics of skin. God then and there, he established what we know as the sacrificial system, which is what Revelation 13, 8 is talking about when you read about this lamb with seven horns and seven eyes, a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. There at the foundation of the world, the sacrificial was system was established and the first death was a lamb, pointing to Jesus, the ultimate lamb. And then you've got Abel, who is a shepherd. The first occupation mentioned in the Bible is a shepherd. Genesis 4.2, Abel was a keeper of sheep. And then, you know, this, of course, bothered um, Cain when God said to Cain, where's your brother? He said, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? And the word keeper there means, am I his shepherd? Again, the term shepherd. So, not only is the first animal to die a sheep, the first human to die is a shepherd, another type of Christ. We already touched on it. Abraham was a shepherd. You can read in Genesis 13, 5. He had flocks and herds. Then you go to Jacob, all the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac had flocks and herds. Jacob, Genesis 30, verse 36. And Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. Laban was his father-in-law. Not only Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Genesis 37, 3. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph being... 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And Joseph got into trouble. He was seeking his missing brothers who were feeding the flock. Then you read about Moses, Exodus 3, 1 and 2. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. You know, um, it probably would be really good training for pastors if part of the curriculum was send them out to New Mexico for six months to take care of sheep. Because you look at some of these great biblical characters, and one of the ways I think God prepared them was shepherding, taking care of sheep. David, 1 Samuel 17, 5, but David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep. Have you noticed something here? It says that Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David are feeding their father's sheep. And uh, that's a, a good uh, example for all pastors. Now, with David in mind, before we rush past this, David is one of the great shepherds. You know, when Samuel comes to anoint the sons of Jesse, and Jesse's got seven of his sons there, and one is missing, um, he says, oh, well, the youngest, he's with the flocks. And uh, David, wonderful voice, became a great musician, quite uh, a marksman with a sling. I think he learned a lot of those things out there in the field during the tedium of watching sheep eat grass. That can't be a lot more exciting than watching paint dry. But it does take a lot of responsibility. And he wrote one of the most beautiful pieces of literature that has ever been written. It's what we call Psalm 23. Now, it's unfortunate that when you mention Psalm 23, people automatically think about a funeral. And you've often probably been to funerals where people read it. I have. And that's because there's one phrase in there that says, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death. But Psalm 23 is not for the dead. Psalm 23 is for the living. Turn in your Bibles, will you please? Turn to Psalm 23. I'm going to read it with you, and I'd like to ask you to read it out loud. And then we're going to go back through it quickly. Psalm 23. I'll give you a moment to find that. You might need to... Open the app on your phone or open the Word of God with verse 1. 
And I want you to say it out loud with me. Are you ready? And it'll be on the screen if you have nothing else. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, as I was reading this and preparing for this message, I thought, that has got so much in it. I could do a 10-part series in just Psalm 23. I thought, maybe I'll write a devotional for one month going through the 23rd Psalm, six verses, one month, 30 days. There's just so much in there. But I don't have time for all of it because I've got more to the message than Psalm 23. But I want to back up a little bit and notice what it says. The Lord is my shepherd. That describes relationship. Now, when you read Psalm 23, how many of you believe you can say the Lord is your shepherd? Do you realize that in order for you to say the Lord is your shepherd, you must say, I am a sheep. Would that be safe to say? Are you a sheep? You know, sheep are not the brightest creatures in the world. <laughs> I was reading a news report in uh, January 8, 2005, according to CBS News. They got a report from Turkey that 1,500 sheep jumped off a cliff 50 feet. 500 of them died. Evidently, while the shepherds were eating breakfast in a distance, figuring they were up on this mesa, rugged area in Turkey there, and, and um, one of the sheep, Edgar, I don't know if that was his name, <laughs> he looked off this cliff and he saw some green grass down there, and it was very steep, but he thought, you know, I think I can do it. And over he went. And then Stanley saw what happened. He said, look, Edgar's down there. He's got some grass. And he went over. And then Betty went. And if this is true, I don't know about their names, but it is true that they just followed each other off a cliff. How many of you, when you grew up, had your parents say, if your friend jumped off a bridge, would you do it? Any of your parents ever, let me see your hands. Yeah, well, it does happen. <laughs> Sheep, like lemmings, will follow each other off a cliff. Now, fortunately, out of the 1,500, only about 450 died because there was such a big pile of dead sheep on the bottom, sorry, I shouldn't laugh, <laughs> that the other sheep going over were cushioned by the ones before them. It is a true story. The Lord is my shepherd. Are you a sheep? You know what the Bible says? All we like sheep and gone astray. Sheep? You know, when you say sheep, there are two kinds of sheep. I think that, you know, God took a very noble creature in the beginning. He established a sacrificial system and a lamb had to die or a couple to cover them with skin. But since men were shepherding sheep through the ages, they have very carefully bred the sheep. And when they consider the best characteristics, when they match up the sheep and they breed them for the best consequences, they are thinking good wool good mutton. They're never thinking intelligence. So the modern domestic sheep have been bred for everything but intelligence. And as a result, they are very helpless creatures. Now I lived, you've heard me say it, nauseam, I lived up in the mountains, rugged mountains, and we had mountain sheep in Southern California, Mount San Jacinto, they have mountain sheep. They are tough. They are not like domestic sheep. They run around the cliffs. They don't fall. They don't jump to their deaths. Uh, they are almost impossible to catch. Somehow they survive the predators because 
They're kind of the way God, I think, first made them. But the domestic sheep, they get more diseases than any other creature. They get sick. They need the anointing. They need the help of the shepherd. Now, sheep aren't, I don't want to make it sound like they're completely stupid. In some ways, they're very intelligent. They memorize faces. Uh, you can change your clothes and they'll look at your face and they'll know you're not fooling them. They memorize voices. Not only can a you hear the voice of its particular lamb and vice versa when there's a flock of hundreds of sheep, they can make out the voice of their parents. They can make out the voice of their shepherds. I remember reading one story where all these shepherds gathered together to have lunch and the, the sheep were all, all their different flocks came together to water at the same stream and when they got done, all the shepherds walked away in different directions and they gave a specific call. And all those sheep that had all been mingled up gossiping together, they took off and they knew which shepherd to follow. So they've got good recognition of voices. So they have some unique traits. They're social creatures. That's why if you're the Lord's shepherd, you shouldn't be all by yourself. You need to be with the flock. Matter of fact, when one sheep gets separated from the flock, you know the parable in Luke 15, the shepherd goes out to bring it back with the flock. And the wolf tries to separate sheep from the flock so he can take them down and separate them from the shepherd. It's not good to stay away from church. We need each other. Even though we know we're sitting with other sheep and sheep are imperfect. The Lord is my shepherd. That talks about a relationship. You notice it doesn't say the Lord is the shepherd. It doesn't say the Lord is a shepherd. It says the Lord is my shepherd. Can you sing that song? I shall not want. Now we don't use the word want the way they did in Old English. Want meant in need. You're not needy. It means I won't be in need. God, any, all my needs are supplied. There's abundance there, a supply. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Now what does sheep eat? Green pastures? That'd be like me lying down in beans, rice, and chips. <laughs> Which I don't know what I think about that. That's got its pros and cons. But I mean, they're surrounded with abundance. It's talking about rest. And it doesn't say he invites us. He makes us. Do we have a command to Shabbat? You know what the word Shabbat means in Hebrew? Rest. God tells us rest. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. It talks about shalom, peace. He leads me beside the still waters. That's refreshment. Like Jesus meets the woman at the well. He restores my soul. Sometimes our souls have problems and he restores our soul. You remember Psalm 51. David is praying, restore unto me the joy of your salvation after he sinned. God can restore us. Some of you have the gift of amen. I'm almost sure. If you use your gift today, it'll be okay with me. Some of you just don't have the gift, but those that do, if you hear anything that inspires you, then again, if nothing inspires you, then keep it to yourself. But I like that. He restores our souls. He leads us in the paths of righteousness. That's guidance. God says, I will lead you. Commit your way unto the Lord. He will direct your path. He's our shepherd. He's telling us what to do. It's, you know, one of the reasons I'm so thankful to be a Christian before I found the Lord. Life had no purpose, no direction. And when you follow the Lord, he tells you where to go. He leads you. Why? For his name's sake. You belong to him. You're adopted, and it's for his glory. You've got purpose. And then there's a promise that though there may be challenges in life there may be dangers and even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death in the time of David there was actually a valley between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea and the very rugged terrain and where the thieves and bandits and wolves would hang out and shepherds winding their sheep through there they were easy prey for an ambush you know sometimes there, there are shepherds that steal sheep just like horse rustlers they had sheep rustlers and, they all, and the shepherd had to protect them from not only wolves, but from people. And when they went through these dangerous regions, they didn't have to be afraid because they had an invincible shepherd. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And yes, quite literally. Do you realize if Jesus doesn't come, there's a 100% death rate. 
with the exception of Elijah and Enoch. That's a very small percentage of several billion. So you don't have to be afraid of death. The shadow of death, it's not real, it's a shadow for believers. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's testing. I will fear no evil. That's protection. Why? For you're with me. It's companionship. That's faithfulness. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This is assurance. I may as well tell you now because you're going to find out. Got an email this week from our head deacon, New California Law. And it says that if anybody on your premises is armed, even though they're trained and they've got a permit, that you must post it somewhere out front. And I told the deacon, praise God, post it. In case you didn't know, there are people that are trained on our premises. I hope it doesn't make you nervous. It's been that way from the beginning. So if you didn't know, just forget what I said. <laughs> if it bothers you. But for some people, you know, it gives you a little security. Your shepherd's got a rod. No, I'm not. I'm, I, not, not me. I mean, I got a belt pack, and that's all I got. But uh, knowing that he's going to protect. Amen? Amen? How many of you are thankful for a strong military? Amen. That's right. It gives us freedom and protection. It says, your staff and your rod, they comfort me. That's also for discipline. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. That means when your enemies think that you're going to be cursed, God says, no, no, they're blessed. That's hope. You anoint my head with oil. You know, sometimes sheep, they had bugs, and the oil anointed would keep the insects away or if they were injured. But for you and me, the oil is what? The Holy Spirit. You give me your spirit. You anoint me. That's consecration. My cup runs over. It's not that you get enough. It's an abundance. Every time Jesus multiplied the bread, there was too much. There was leftovers. God offers us an abundance. And then there's the promise, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That gives you confidence as you look at the future. That's blessing. And then the ultimate blessing, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. That's heaven. That's family. How long? Forever. That's eternity. All in that psalm coming from a shepherd. It's good for us to know something about sheep. Notice one more thing. In Psalm 23, it says, With me, my shepherd. Before me, a table. Around me, my enemies. After me, goodness and mercy. Beyond me, the house of the Lord. It's like a GPS. It gives you the location and purpose of where you are. So we're jumping to the New Testament, which is very relevant for our season now. And go to the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse 8. This is the Gospel of Luke, where, of course, those angels made that amazing announcement. Now there were in that same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. They're out there with their sheep, not only in the day, they're with them in the night. And behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then these angels said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a shepherd, a Savior, who is the Lamb, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. That's not a sign. That's what they do with all newborn babies. They wrap them up. Here's the sign. Laying in a food trough for cattle. So here you've got shepherds giving the news about the bread of life and the Lamb of God that's in a shepherd trough. 
for feeding cattle, born in a town called the House of Bread, Bethlehem, full of significance. And suddenly, when this angel gets done with his message, a multitude of the heavenly hosts, they could not keep back the good news. They pulled back the veil, they revealed themselves, and the heavens is lit up, and the fields lit up, and they began to sing, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. Jesus coming is good news, friends. Amen? Amen. So when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go. Shepherds should be telling the good news. Amen? They said, let us go to Bethlehem and see the thing that has come to pass, or in the fields outside of Bethlehem, that the Lord has shown to us. Now, how do you think those shepherds felt that night? What do you think they were talking about? I think they were out there thinking, you know, I wonder how long the Romans are going to occupy us. When will the Messiah come? Shouldn't it be about time? And uh, wasn't, it, wasn't it interesting? We heard this story about Elizabeth and that the, the angel said, God's going to give them a baby and, and uh, that baby's going to make the way of the Lord. And, and there was all these signs and things that were happening. They were thinking about this. It's interesting that he was revealed, the coming of the Lord was revealed not to the priests, but to the shepherds. God uses humble instruments. Let's go find out. And they came in haste and didn't take long. Bethlehem wasn't that big. And they found whether it was a barn or a cave. We don't know. It doesn't say. But they found a place where here's his mother. She's got a little baby in the trough. They knew right away what it was. When they'd seen him, they made widely known the saying. And when we see Jesus, we need to make widely known the saying concerning the child. Now, not only were the shepherds witnesses, who else were witnesses? The sheep. It says they were with their flocks. You wonder what the sheep thought when they saw and heard the angels. Amen? And the shepherds returned, glorifying God. Three times this is the shepherds, the shepherds, the shepherds. When Jesus came into our world there, here you've got this unexpected appearance to an unlikely audience bringing an astonishing message of an unusual arrival the simple shepherds heard the voice of an angel. They found their lamb. If like those shepherds you have heard and seen, like the shepherds, go and tell. When they heard and they saw, they went and they told. Now, we are lambs, but we're also shepherds too. Did you know that? That's right. The apostles started out lambs. They started out sheep. And they ended up shepherds. I'm going to take you to a verse in the end of the Bible in Revelation chapter 7. It's something of a, um, it, it's almost like a contradiction. It's counterintuitive. Revelation 7, 16 and 17. Revelation 7, 16 and 17. And they will hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching. Notice this. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. Now, wait a second. How many of you have seen the lamb walking around with a shepherd's stick? The lamb will be their shepherd. You know, Jesus is our lamb. He's our lion. He's our shepherd. He is a living water. You're not only lambs, but God calls you to be shepherds too. So what I'm saying about shepherds is not just for pastors but it's for believers. Now, shepherding is a humble occupation. You can read in the Bible that uh, when Jacob moved to Egypt with his family, he said, let us live in Goshen, because Joseph, knowing that among the Egyptians, the most lowly occupation, not too many kids would say, when I grow up, I want to be a shepherd. You know, you want to be a doctor, you want to be a, a lawyer, or, well, maybe not a lawyer, but <laughs> sorry, lawyers out there. <laughs> but, the, you know, the, you think you got this ambition, but a shepherd. You can read where it says in uh, Genesis 46, 34, every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. They kind of, you know, they, 
have to knock off their boots if they come in your house because they've been out there with the sheep. I'll leave the rest to your imagination. Shepherds are watchful. They're vigilant. Who was it that was ready for the first coming? The shepherds, because they were watching. Genesis 31, by the way, Jesus tells us, watch therefore. We need to be watching for the second coming. Genesis 31, when Jacob is talking to his father-in-law and he's describing what he had been through as a shepherd, he says, 20 years I've been with you. Your ewes and your she-goats have not cast their young. They did not miscarry because I was there to help them. And the rams of the flock I have not eaten. I protected them. That which was torn of beasts I brought not to you. I bear the loss of it. And my hand, at my hand you did require it, whether stolen by day or night. He was striving to protect them. Thus I was in the day, the drought consumed me, burning under the sun in the day, and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. You can remember how Jacob met Rachel. What was he doing? He uncovered the well. It took several men to uncover the well and water the sheep, and he uncovered it by himself. Jacob was very strong. He wrestled with an angel. How did Moses meet his wife? He drove off these bad shepherds that were hurting the shepherd girls. Ended up marrying one of them, right? It's all in the context of shepherding. God could not use Moses to lead the people until he had taken care of sheep. Joseph, before he could lead the people, he had to humble himself and take care of sheep. David, before he could lead the people, he had to be the youngest that would take care of the sheep. By the way, Joseph, David, Moses were youngest. Of course, Benjamin was a little younger, but... I mean, 11 out of 12 is pretty young for Joseph. Good shepherds are watchful. A good shepherd is sacrificial. Jesus said in John 10, verse 11, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I love that story in the Bible where David comes to King Saul, and he says, I'll go fight the giant. And Saul said, what, are you crazy? He's a man of war since his youth, and you're just a youth. What makes you think you can kill the giant? David said, well, I take care of my father's sheep and a bear came and I went out after the bear. He took one of the lambs and I killed the bear. And it says he, it didn't say he killed him with a sling. It says I took him by the beard and I smote him. Now, a lot of people think that's a fable. But then I heard on the news that a man in Canada was walking in the woods and a bear attacked him and he wrestled free and he grabbed a limb that had fallen from a tree and he struck the bear which dazed it and he got up and afraid the bear was coming again he hit it again and he kept hitting it until he killed it and the forestry officials came out evidently it was a mother bear that got threatened normally black bears don't attack but the man killed a bear with a stick so I believe the Bible amen, amen. and then he says and a lion came and I put my life on the line to take the lamb from the lion. Now, if David will do that for a sheep, I mean, I don't know. Whenever I hear this story, I've got to make a confession. I never had sheep, but I had goats. And a bear came once and got one of our goats. I actually got two of our goats, but I didn't hear it when the first one was taken. And uh, our gun was out in the pickup truck, and all I had was a twenty-two. And the goat's name was Libby. And we heard bang in the house. The whole house shook because Libby slept under the house. And this is up in the hills. And um, then we heard her screaming. And we knew a bear had gotten her. And we heard her crying as a bear is carrying her up the hill in the dark. And I thought, do I go out to my truck to get the 22 and chase the bear in the dark with a 22? Do you realize if you shoot a bear with a 22, they just get angry. Yeah, they feel like there are bees stinging them. And I felt like I'm just not a very good shepherd. But I felt much better when I remember little Libby was a goat, and you know, goats, they're not going to make it anyway. So. <laughs> but I had to ask myself, I mean, why do shepherds raise sheep? Don't they eventually butcher them? They get the wool? And David was willing to die 
for a sheep. Shepherds are sacrificial. The way they suffer to take care of these sheep, Jesus said the good shepherd lays down his life to protect the sheep. A good shepherd leads the sheep. And the sheep follow. Genesis 33. And he said unto him, and this is when uh, Jacob is reunited with Esau, and Esau says, here, join me. And he said, look, you got your soldiers, and I got my sheep. He says, I can't keep up with the soldiers. We got to be tender. I'm going to lead the sheep. It says in Genesis 33, 13, he said to him, my Lord knows that the children are tender, and the flocks and the herds that are with me are young, and if the men should overdrive them one day, the flock will die. I heard about a tourist that was in Israel, and he saw the traffic stopped and all these sheep were crossing the road and there was a man behind them that was kind of cracking a whip and snapping a stick and driving the sheep. And uh, he couldn't resist. He got out of his car because he had to stop anyway. He walked over to the shepherd as he was crossing and he said to him, he said, can I ask you a quick question? He said, yeah. He said, I've just always read and heard in the Bible that in the Middle East that the shepherds lead their sheep and you're driving them. And the man said with his, you know, Israeli accent. He says, no, this is true. This is true. The shepherd leads the sheep. He says, but I'm not a shepherd. He says, I'm a butcher. He <laughs> says, I'm taking them to slaughter. You get some pastors lead their sheep and some drive their sheep. The devil, he drives his sheep. He's a butcher. So the shepherd leads them. A good shepherd feeds his sheep. And he feeds them good food. You know, sometimes sheep don't know what to eat. They'll eat whatever's around them. And the shepherd needs to lead them to where the green pasture is. Some weeds and things a sheep might eat uh, could do them in. And so they have to be sensitive to that. We need to feed them the good food. Jeremiah 23, 1. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them. Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed, therefore, Paul is speaking, to yourself and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. God wants us to take heed to feed the flock. John 21, 15. You know, when uh, Jesus rose from the dead, Peter had denied Christ three times. And, and uh, Jesus said, Peter, do you love me more than these? And Peter said, Lord, you know that I love you. He wouldn't compare himself to his friends anymore. At one time he had said, though all these forsake you, I won't forsake you. He doesn't include his friends anymore. And he just says, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. A little while later, Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know I love you. He said, feed my lambs. So Jesus distinctly said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Then he asks him a third time, Peter, do you love me? And he said, feed my sheep. Three times, feed the sheep, feed the sheep, feed the sheep. You know, I'm convinced that it's not that hard to grow a church if you feed them the bread of life. Amen. And we've had pastors that have been upset with us because they felt we were stealing their sheep. And we say, well, the sheep go where the grass is. Amen. So if you just feed people the word, they're hungering and thirsting for the truth. 1 Peter 2, verse 5, Feed the flock of God that is among you, being examples to the flock, and the chief shepherd shall appear, and you'll receive a crown of glory. Friends, is it my imagination? Are you finding sheep and shepherds all through the Bible? It's everywhere. Sheep will follow the shepherd's voice. I touched on that briefly. Jesus said, John 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Heard another story that... Uh, a tourist heard this was true that the sheep will only follow the shepherd's voice and the tourist said, no, they see your clothes. They don't recognize your voice. The shepherd said, try it. He put on his clothes and he walked off in the distance and the tourist, he called the sheep and he said, tell me what their names are. He called them by name. They didn't budge. And the shepherd now, who is not wearing his outside outfit, he called them. They came right away. They knew the sound of his voice. Now, the sheep need to be careful now because have you heard about AI? Do any of you see, I put out a video on my Facebook page. We're running a test. I was preaching, and they got this program now where they took a little, an excerpt of a sermon. It's only a minute long. And, I, and they can translate 
to another language. And I want to know, is the translation accurate? Not only can they translate it, they can make my lips move with the translation. If you want to see that, go to my Facebook page. I'm speaking Tagalog <laughs> with Pastor Ross, who's speaking Hindi. No, <laughs> but you, you, you can do that. You can make, and the thing is, they take a sample of my voice and then it sounds like me, which is fascinating and frightening. Yeah, you think about the ways the gospel can use that. We're talking about doing real life translation when we go to New York City next fall in all these languages. Wouldn't that be wonderful? We used to have to have rooms full of translators. We flew in and fed from around the country. How much cheaper to just be able to real time convert it. But the devil can use it too. He's going to be having overwhelming deceptions in the last days. The good shepherd will discipline his sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray. And the Bible says in Hebrews 2.16, For the Lord disciplines him who he loves and chastens every son who he receives. Someone saw a man with his flock in some eastern country and one of the sheep had a splint on. He said, how did, how did the lamb break his leg? Shepherd said, oh, I broke it. You broke it? He said, yeah. He says, that sheep, he kept going off, wouldn't listen to me, kept getting into dangerous situations and so I struck his leg just it's a hairline fracture and then I bind it up and he then stays close to me kind of hobbles him until it heals up and he learns to stick with me sometimes God has had to hobble us to get us to turn to him that's the loving discipline of our Lord affliction is God's dog that drives the sheep back to the shepherd and a good shepherd will seek the lost sheep Jesus said, what do you think? A man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray and it's dark and it's stormy. Some of us might say, well, dumb sheep, what do you expect? But no, that shepherd leaves the 99 safe in the fold and he goes looking for that lost sheep. What did Jesus say when he found Zacchaeus? He says, the son of man has come to seek and save that which is lost. And at the peril of his life, he goes looking for the lost sheep. Now God wants to look for you. If you've got a parent, you've got 10 children and one of them wanders from the faith at Thanksgiving, you've got an empty chair. Do you say, oh well, 90% is good or is that parent's heart going out after that one empty chair? The Lord doesn't want you to be missing from his table, friends. He wants his children, his lambs there. You know, you've probably heard that song, beautiful song called The 90 and 9. I think it was sung by Ira Sankey in, in Dwight Moody's campaigns. A beautiful story about how the shepherd goes out looking for that lost sheep. Now we're going to be singing a closing hymn. We're not going to be singing that one. But I, I've got a final illustration. I'm going to invite our, um, our choir and orchestra to come up. It's going to take them a moment to do that. And I'm going to tell you about uh, an interesting story. I don't know if you read it a few years ago about a lamb called Shrek. I didn't name him. That's a picture of him up on the screen. Shrek was sort of an independent sheep in New Zealand. And when it came time for shearing, they shear them every year. You know, in the springtime when it's warm, they go through shearing. They get all the winter wool off so they don't get too hot in the summer. Shrek did not like the idea of being sheared. For whatever reason, when it was shearing time, he knew and he would run off and hid in a cave. And you might think, well, how come the shepherd didn't know? Well, this is a farm in New Zealand with 17,000 sheep. Shrek was rather independent. And not only did he miss his shearing one year or two years, but for six years he avoided being sheared until he got where he couldn't even see because the wool was blocking his eyes. He used to have to shake his head around to try and make it from step to step. And when he'd fall down, he could scarcely get up. And he was covered with dirty, stinking fur. And eventually, someone had heard word about this, this great big sheep that had somehow avoided shearing. And they told the shepherd, and he found him, and he looked like the giant end of a dirty Q-tip. <laughs> Shrek was finally captured for his own good. He, he couldn't run anymore. And when everybody saw him, they put out pictures. They said, we're going to publicly shear him. 
And the shepherd got together with a crowd, 300 people gathered, and uh, with expert finesse, if you've ever seen how these Australian shepherds shear their sheep, and they got, they got this, these shears that are really fast, and not like the old ones that were big old primitive scissors that would often nip and cut, and they just go, zee, zee, and that, that fur goes flying off. They got 60 pounds of fur from Shrek. And I think there's a picture of how much better Shrek is doing. Did you put that one up on the screen? Yeah. Now, this is a few years ago, and I think that Shrek, Shrek has gone to that great big pasture in the sky at this point. But just think about that, running from the shepherd, thinking he had something to hurt him, but it was a burden. Have you been burdened, friends? The shearing was not because the shepherd wanted to hurt him. The shepherd wanted to save him. And sometimes we go astray, and it ends up dragging us down. We're looking for freedom from the shepherd. Instead, we be, we're carrying around a burden of sin. And Jesus wants to remove that burden, friends. Amen? That's the good news that the angels sang about, that Jesus came to save us from our sins so we can be in the house of the Lord forever. How many of you want to uh, be in that place?